It's time now for Countywide, a special presentation of Yavapai Broadcasting News. Join Paul David and Kyle Benedict as they talk with our community's leaders, newsmakers, and people in the know. You'll hear about the hot topics that affect all our lives in Yavapai County. And now here's today's Countywide. Welcome to County Wide. I'm Kyle Benedict. Today we're talking uh, technical rescue team over at Sedona Fire District, specifically uh, some swift water rescues. And here is technical rescue team leader Alan Schimberg from the Sedona Fire District. Thanks for being here, Alan. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, we, we, we've we been talking about El Nino a lot this winter, and um, with that comes a lot of precipitation. We had uh, just several storm events up in Flagstaff especially dropping a lot of snow um, and so that kind of is what brought up this idea but first off before we get into it um, you're the technical rescue team leader over there at the Sedona Fire District tell me about yourself and how long have you been with Sedona Fire okay yeah I've been with Sedona Fire District for 14 years hmm. I got on the technical rescue team my first year which was 2002 and since then I've been able to work up to a role where I now am in charge of all of the training and the organization and the purchasing of equipment and stuff like that for the team. It's that team leader role. And um, so, you know, we, we uh, instruct all of our members and train quite a bit in Sedona. We have a significant amount of calls there, so we really need to keep up on the training there. So I oversee that program under the direction of a battalion chief who's in charge of special operations. Okay, and we're going to get into the training, um, kind of certain scenarios uh, later on in the show, but we're talking about the technical rescue team. What does that exactly consist of? So uh, we have an A, a B, and a C shift in Sedona Fire, and um, so every day there's uh, six trained members that are on duty uh, each shift. So we have 18 total members that are on the technical rescue team that are trained to a higher level, a technician level in rope rescue and swift water rescue. And then on top of that in Sedona, because of the you know amount of calls that we run, um, we uh, have every single person on our fire department has to go through uh, technical rescue training in rope and swift water every year and they're trained at an operations level but they're really critical to the success of you know a, a swift water rescue call or a, or a rope rescue call and they, they fill in a support role and and uh, so it's critical you know for the whole thing to kind of come together for success yeah I guess Sedona is, is a really unique place and you have all these um, recreation activities and these opportunities for people whether it's uh, hiking a lot of rock climbing and um, obviously we have Oak Creek going right through there and the canyon and whatnot. So in terms of training, are you guys training throughout the year or when, when do you go out and train? I know you just had one, right? Yeah, actually uh, just yesterday we trained all day in swift water rescue. And so what, what we do there is we have a program where we train our technical rescue team members, those 18 people that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. We do nine technical rescue drills every single year. And those are six to eight hours in length, and our members have to attend, you know, a certain percentage of those. So they're they're getting trained, you know, at a higher level almost every month of the year. Oh, and then wow. we we train our operations level people. We do annual swift water rescue and rope rescue refresher training. And everybody on the department every three years has to recertify. Uh, and, you know, we follow the guidance of NFPA, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard about. You know, they set standards for the fire service. So we try hardest to adhere to those standards, and so we keep everybody trained. Um, so, you know, what it boils down to is we, we're doing technical rescue training the entire calendar year. Okay, and does that take place in Sedona, or you guys go out of the city for that? Yeah, most of it takes place in Sedona. Okay. Those 18 people, uh, that w when we do our uh, big, large-scale swift water rescue training, we have to go out of state because Arizona is unpredictable when it comes to water flows. Mm. So it's really hard logistically to plan something that big to train 18 people in swift water rescue uh, when you may not have the water flows in Arizona. So, you know, historically we've gone to California to the Kern River to accomplish that training. Just this last year, we went to uh, Durango, Colorado, and trained on the Animas River. Oh wow! Um, because we can have guaranteed water flows there, you know, so that we don't end up embarking on something and we don't have the water there to support it. So, with are, are you guys doing any more preparation or training for this uh, El Nino 
uh, winter that we're seeing here. Was there any more work that went in to prepare for this? Yeah, a lot of it's more um, awareness. You know, because we do annual, you know, year-long training, we, we really try to keep our people up to speed on, you know, the swift water rescue and the rope rescue stuff. Um, but just a few weeks ago, there was a pretty large-scale meeting of the mines, if you will, down here in Cottonwood, where we had, you know, all the local fire departments, the police department, we had county emergency managers, um, the city of Cottonwood was involved, Clarkdale was involved, we had public works there, uh, the roads and streets, and we kind of all just came together and, and collaborated on how we can more effectively work together when we have these large scale flooding events that affect the entire Verde Valley. And I know with those meetings, a lot of the, the uh, conversation is about preparedness and from the, uh, uh, I guess just residents in the community, whether in you're in Coconino County or Yapai County, um, a lot of people are, are trying to figure <coughs> out how to stay informed and, and be warned whenever these situations are coming up or there's a flood or we saw it with the slide fire in the canyon there a couple of years ago as well. Uh, how is the public able to stay informed when something's going on in their area? Yeah, well, the, you know, the public can always access, you know, any of their local fire department's websites or even call them to try to get more information about how they can be prepared. But, uh, you know, they have established something called uh, Code Red, which is a really uh, awesome service that's out there for the, for the public. It's a free service that people can register for. Hmm. And uh, I know that you might be able to find that on the county websites, whether it be Yavapai or Coconino and uh, just look for a code red button that you can push and that enables you to be able to register yourself. You can register your address, phone number, um, give some little bit of information about yourself, how many people you have in your home, what kind of pets you have and stuff like that. And what that allows the county to do is if we have an event, you know, such as a large scale flooding event or a fire, even a tornado warning or any sort of large storm event, power outage, anything like that, um, they can alert you depending upon where you live, you know, uh, and where you've registered. So that, that enables people to, to get either a text message, a phone call. They also have the uh, uh, phone for the deaf that can, that can also come into play there if, if uh, you're hearing impaired. And um, they, they also have a, a code red mobile app, which is really nice because if you have your GPS turned on on your phone, then if there's an event in an area where you are located, well then it'll send you an alert to your, mm -hmm. to your, uh, you know, your phone via text message or whatever and uh, let you know what's going on. That way you have some time to sort of prepare for it, get out of the area if need be. And, uh, you know, preparedness is really um, maybe stocking up on a little bit of stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're one of those people that lives somewhere that has to use a low water crossing to access your neighborhood or your home, might be a good idea in this El Nino period where you might have a little bit of extra stuff at your home just in case the water comes up and it's up for a few days and you can't get out, um, you know, you're ready for that. Okay. You've kind of stocked up. Okay, well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll cover some scenarios and some of the things that they're looking at whenever there's a storm up north and, and kind of what that recipe is that creates flooding down here in the Verde Valley and Sedona area. So that's coming up here on Countywide. We'll be back in a couple minutes. Morning, Gary. We are GetSchooled.com. You want a college education, don't you? You know you do. That's why we're here. We're free and here to guide you through every step of the way, starting with attendance. <laughs> Gary, financial aid forms. Picking a college, man. You and us we go together like tacos and Tuesday. And I love tacos. Go to GetSchool.com.
Don't wait. Communicate. Make your emergency plan today. I'm Kyle Benedict sitting down with uh, Sedona Fire District's technical rescue team leader, Alan Schimberg, and we're talking about uh, specifically really swift water rescues with El Nino this winter and a lot of precipitation expected this winter. Um, we're just kind of covering what their training consists of in, in the event of flooding. So real quick, I want to give you some contact information, a good phone number uh, for the Sedona Fire District, 928-282-6800. You can also find more information uh, at SedonaFire.org. Okay, Alan, so uh, when there is, you guys get word that there's a storm approaching, whether it's down here or up north, um, what is kind of that recipe for that creates flooding down here in the Verde Valley? Yeah, so we, uh, you know, we pay pretty close attention to the storm warnings that are taking place in Arizona. Um, the uh, weather service, you know, we, we look at all their updates and kind of we try to stay a little bit ahead of the curve when, when there's something coming in. We want to know if there's going to be, you know, a, a large snow event or a large rain event and kind of what's going on with that. Um, another way that we stay informed is, is by checking different uh, gauges that are on the waterways throughout the Verde Valley so that we also know, you know, how many cubic feet per second are coming down Oak Creek right now. You know, when are those spikes that we see in the, in the water flow, which typically, believe it or not, occur at nighttime? Hmm. Because if you think about it, if you have a lot of snow up in Flagstaff, it melts all day and it kind of fills all those tributaries and it takes a little bit of time for it to actually reach Oak Creek. And by that time, the sun's down. And uh, so the, the really high water level marks that we see when we look at the data is at nighttime. Um, and you know, and then it works its way down all the way down into the Verde Valley. So we'll see it a little bit before, you know, Cottonwood, Montezuma, Rimrock, Camp Verde. We'll kind of experience it first as far as Oak Creek goes. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, what we what we really look at, kind of as like an action point for us or a trigger point, is when we have a large snow event that occurs in the higher country up in up in Flagstaff's area, and. Uh, it's followed up very closely with a little bit of a warming trend mm. that brings more precipitation in the form of rain. So you have all that snow on the ground and then, you, and then it warms up, it rains on top of that. Well, the rain rapidly accelerates the melting of the snow. And so that's when we'll see Oak Creek go from, you know, a calm little mellow stream to, uh, you know, a raging, torrentially raging river, you know, thousands and thousands of cubic feet per second. And, and that's really, you know, the action point for us. Um, those, are, those are the times when we see rescues, you know, go up, when we see um, that water level come up really rapidly, really fast, and it's, it's significant. And and so, I'm sure when you guys get called out at that, I mean, at that moment, time is a huge factor. So you got to kind of be on point and know exactly what you're going to do. And that's where the training comes in. Um, in terms of your training, can you take me through, uh, say, a training uh, session? What are you guys covering? Uh, what does that training consist of? What are, you, what are you working for? Yeah, sure. So like I was saying earlier, we have kind of two levels of training. We have that operations level training that we run all our members through. And then we have that higher level of training, which is the technician level. So the operations level training is really um, kind of a support role. These are the people that are on the bank with um, throw bags, you know, which is, which is a really lightweight uh, 75 to 100 foot rope that floats on the water. Um, so, so we'll kind of uh, train those people on how to use those throw bags, throw those to somebody who's moving down a, a waterway and uh, you know, try to try to practice really how to throw and how to hit those people, and and then how to coach them what to do with the rope once they receive it, 
so that we can move them to the shore. We also train those folks at, um, you know, doing shallow water crossings. So a lot of our rescues can be mitigated simply. And if the water flow, the velocity of the water is not too high and the depth is not too high, well then we can kind of gather together with, you know, four or five of our members and move out as a unit um, into the water and move out to a vehicle that might be stuck or something like that and get somebody off of the hood of their car or out of the back of their vehicle or off of a boulder or, or something like that. Something else that we, uh, we do that's kind of unique um, is we, we can actually fill our larger diameter fire hoses with air using the SCBA cylinders that we carry on our back for fires. Oh, really? So we have these adapters. We can, we can roll out 100 feet of hose, put these connectors on it, fill it with air, and now that's going to float. So we can, we can hang those you know, um, on the downstream side of a bridge. And if somebody comes underneath that bridge who's, who's trapped in the water, you know, we can drop that in the water for them. They can grab onto that. We can get them to shore that way. So those are a few of the operations level types of training. Mm -hmm. um, the technician level is really more of in water stuff. So we, uh, we mitigate a lot of our rescues by using a raft. Um, that, that's, you know, kind of a go-to way for us to get people out of harm's way. It's safer for us rather than swimming, which we do that as well. So our technician level people, as far as the training goes, you know, we'll, we'll uh, train them how to navigate class three and class four, which is big rapids, um, in a raft and, and move out to somebody that's stuck in a vehicle or something like that, park the raft behind them, mm -hmm. get them into the boat, get them back to shore. And then, you know, lastly, which is the most hazardous, is, is we train our folks to be able to actually swim out into a, a, a rapid and, uh, you know, get to somebody, grab them, and swim them to shore. I imagine actually getting physically in the water is probably the last option. Yes, exactly. When, now, when exactly, um, can you take me through a scenario where that would be the case, where you are forced to get in the water? Sure. Yeah, we kind of, we try to keep it as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. So we follow something called reach, throw, row, and then go, which is last. Kind of, that's kind of our risk, you know, from high to low, how we approach these rescues. We want to try to reach them. If we can't reach them, we want to throw something to them. If we can't do that, then, you know, we'll row a boat. And then lastly is that go rescue is what you're talking about, where we swim out to somebody. And we've had to do those rescues where, you know, they're stuck in a situation or, or just because of the topography and the layout of the river um, or what's going on, we are not going to be able to use a raft to get to them. We can't reach them with anything. A throw bag's not going to make it, so we'll actually have to swim somebody out to them um, and, and, you know, grab a hold of them and bring them back in. And we've done a few of those. Um, also, what can happen is if, if you have some people, let's say, that are stuck uh, on a vehicle in the water, and we're, we're, you know, have a plan that we're rolling out to try to get to those people and something happens like the vehicle shifts in the water and moves, people fall off. Well, below the rescue, we always have kind of what we call a containment plan. And that containment plan might be that we have a couple people that are, you know, in a dry suit or a wetsuit mm -hmm. ready to go. Um, they have, a, you know, a rope clip to their life jacket and they're down there. And if that happens, then that person might swim out to those people, grab them, and get towed back into the shore. So that's kind of like a backup, you know, but it is last resort. Putting our people in the water is dangerous, so we want to try to avoid it if we can. Yeah, man, it just seems like a, a really big operation to go out there and, <clears throat> and rescue someone like that where the training comes in, making sure everything's firing on all cylinders. Absolutely. Okay, well, we got to take another break. Sitting down with Sedona Fire talking about Swift Water Rescue and their technical rescue team. Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll have more countywide. Plan today. Hey Gabby, how you doing? 
How was the play date and sleepover? Dad, it was great. Awesome. Okay, I'm on my way. Hey, guys, what are you doing? We're going swimming. We're going biking. Yeah. I'll see you in a little bit, guys. I love you. Hi, babe. How was school today? Hi, Dad. It was great. Okay, honey. I'll be home soon. Remember, you're never too far away from your kids to be a dad. Reach out and take a second to check in because sometimes the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. This is the story of a boy who was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where nothing could get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. It made him feel uncomfortable. One day, he found out he had something called autism. His family got him help. And slowly, he learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. Todd's a great guy. I mean, look at him. What a sweetheart. boy. Wait, Todd, what are you doing? How totally selfish and untod like of you. Come on, Todd. Come on, man. Welcome back to Countywide. I'm Kyle Benedict, sitting down with Alan Schimberg. He's the technical rescue team leader over at Sedona Fire District, talking about Swiftwater rescues. Before the break, he talked about uh, all the training that takes place, the different scenarios, kind of the uh, um, the process on when they actually get in the water. If they can, they're going to try and throw something to you first to get you uh, to the shore, back to safety. Um, one question I have for you, Alan, is when, if I'm out there in a vehicle trying to you know, cross two feet of water. I get stuck out there um, and I call you. And I'm, am I gonna get billed the next day for this? Does this cost to have you guys come out and rescue me? Right, uh, yeah, that's a great question. And that's been something that's been debated for quite a long time. And the answer is no, not, not up here in Northern Arizona, at least. In, in our area, there is no charge for rescue. And, and the reason is, is because we have found that, you know, and it's been proven over time that if people know that they're gonna get charged for rescue, then it's gonna deter them from calling for help when they need it. Mm -hmm. And people are gonna be more inclined to try to self-rescue as opposed to call for help, which usually puts them you know, in, in much more of a dangerous situation if they try to self-rescue. So because of those reasons, we do not charge for rescue and neither do any of the uh, local agencies around here. It's just been been shown that it's it's better and safer for everybody if we don't do that. Okay, yeah, I mean, the last thing you want is somebody not calling for help because they're worried about being charged for that. Exactly, and if they don't call for help and they try to get themselves out of harm's way, a lot of times that prolongs the, the you know, us being able to help them, and now we're looking at uh, having to do that operation at nighttime. Hmm. Okay, so I guess you know you guys had training that, uh, earlier this week, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then you mentioned you guys are always kind of keeping up on the training throughout the year. Um, and I guess you know we're in kind of a warming period right now, temperatures, high temperatures, but they still say the Weather Service that there's still some uh, activity out there in the Pacific. So I'm sure you guys are keeping an eye on that. You mentioned you guys are always getting weather reports, right? Yeah, we're always checking the, the gauges, like I said, getting those weather reports. Mm -hmm. And we're just kind of waiting. You know, I, I really anticipate that we probably will get some more large scale snow events uh -huh. up in Flagstaff, followed by raining and stuff like that. So we're definitely anticipating some events this spring. Great. So we're, we're just really keeping aware. Okay. Real quick, we want to remind people, Code Red, uh, encourage residents of Coconino and Yapai County to sign up for Code Red. You can do that on your county's website. Um, Alan, that's it. We're out of time. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Real quick, for more information, you can call the Sedona Fire District at 928-282-6800 or visit their website, sedonafire.org. That's going to do it today for Countywide. We'll see you next time.